Hello, everybody. Welcome to MHTV. We're really pleased to have you with us tonight. Tonight, we're going to be talking about learning disability nursing, and we really want you to join in and share your thoughts. So in order to process that, let's go to Dave, and he can show you how you can join in. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Nikki. Yeah, so uh, welcome. And the two ways that you can join in tonight, as always, uh, the first is on Facebook Live. All you need to do is head towards the side of the video, uh, there's a place where you can put your text in uh, and if you want to put in any questions or comments uh, and we'll feed in as many as we can tonight. Uh, the other option you've got is over on Twitter. So whilst you're watching, if you want to have Twitter open, all you have to do is include the hashtag MHTV in the tweet that you send. We'll be able to see that and again, we'll bring it into the conversation. But again, without further ado, back to you, Nikki. Okay, so introducing our guest tonight, Jonathan, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Hello, um, I'm Jonathan Beebe. I'm a registered nurse for people for learning disabilities. Um, I've been qualified since 2002. Um, had a wide variety of roles. Um, at the moment, I have two two roles that I primarily work in. Um, firstly, I am the professional lead for learning disabilities with the Royal College of Nursing. I've been in post there uh, for nearly a year now. And um, secondly, um, I am uh, Chief Enablement Officer and Nurse Consultant for PBS4, which is a clinically led social care company for um, people with learning disabilities. A difficult time, I think, for all people working in health and social care at the minute. But I guess maybe what would be helpful for us just to get kind of a context of what we're thinking about is if you can tell us a little bit about what is learning disability nursing and what it helps to understand a bit about the diversity of that role, because it is huge. Mm -hmm. So learning disability nursing is one of the four fields of nursing. It's a point of registration. So um, myself and, and all the other learning disability nurses out there, um, we went straight to being a student nurse and studied for three years how to be a learning disability nurse. Um, the profession has been around for about 100 years. Uh, we had 100 year celebrations back in 2019, just before the pandemic kicked in. Um, and... Yeah, we, we work in a, a very, very wide variety of settings, really. Um, there was some research done by uh, a man called Stephen Rose, and it was largely very informal research on social media. And he found 120 different job titles that, that learning disability nurses had. So um, you will find us in learning disability services in the NHS. Um, so we'll work in community teams or we'll work in inpatient services. Um, the, those learning disability teams have really diversified uh, in, in the 20 years of my career. Um, you'll find us in uh, mainstream hospitals, uh, in, in general hospitals, uh, on uh, acute wards. Uh, you'll find us in GP practices sometimes, um, in mental health um, services, mm. um, and in social care providers, uh, even, and even a few of us in the criminal justice system as well. So yeah. um, very wide and diverse roles um, as a learning disability nurse. Perfect. Is it worth oh. me just mentioning a bit about what we mean by learning disabilities, perhaps? So, Definitely. Because so, I think learning disabilities does sometimes get confused with, with learning difficulties. So... The definition of a, a learning disability is um, a significant intellectual impairment. Um, historically, that's been measured as an IQ of 70 or below. Um, we tend to rely less on the IQ scores in contemporary practice, but it has to be a significant intellectual impairment that affects someone's ability to learn. It's a disability in learning, ultimately. Um, it also has to have significant adaptive skills. So a person with a learning disability wouldn't be able to meet all their own self-care needs, survive independently without support. And the third element is um, that it um, started before the age of 18. So myself, I had a head injury when I was 19 years old. Um, because that was after 18, it wouldn't be classed as a learning disability because it didn't happen in my formative years of life. Yeah. Um, typically, it includes things like um, Down syndrome, autism, cerebral palsy. There's, there's often 
um, conditions associated with it. But I suppose for for thirty percent of people with learning disabilities, there's a known cause like Down syndrome. For the other seventy percent, it's iatrogenic. There's no known reason for it uh, at all. So it's just there. And you were saying before we got started that this is not like a, a universal acknowledgement that there are there perhaps aren't learning disability nurses in other countries. Can you tell us a little bit about what's what the situation is more globally? Yeah, the, I mean the, the um there aren't really learning disability nurses as a as a field of nursing in other countries. Yeah. Um you will find it in some, I believe Australia has some. Um more often than not, it would be there will be nurses obviously working with people with learning disabilities, but they um, will be trained as a registered nurse and they'll have done additional training or working there. So um, America is a good example where registered nurses do a, a further qualification in developmental disabilities and then they work yeah. uh, in developmental disability services. Yeah. So yeah, it's not a point of entry. We're quite unique in the UK. Yeah. Yeah. And I think as well, where historically people with learning disabilities have been kept from sight. So um, if you go back to you know, 1919, when learning disability nursing started, yeah. um, all learning disability support would have been delivered in a big institution at that point in time. Um, so people with learning disabilities would have been kept behind closed doors, out of sight and out of mind. Yeah times have changed thankfully and people with learning disabilities are now integrated into our community and learning disability nurses have followed and we're integrated in the community too but mm. I think where learning disabilities have been kept behind closed doors quite often learning disability nurses have been kept behind closed doors as well and it's thinking well mm. who are these people where, where have they come from what do they do mm. um, and we are I think re-establishing our role reinventing our careers now in, in 21st century and contemporary practice. Mm. I mean, like you're saying, you, you came into post of like a year ago, just right in the middle of COVID, which cannot have been easy. So what's the situation? How's COVID impacted on um, people with learning disabilities and, and services that you're providing? Um, it's affected people in different ways. So for, for some people, um, it, it's meant that their routine and structure is gone uh, and all the things that they value in life um, that make them know that the world is a safe place Mm. have disappeared and they found it really really distressing mm. um it's meant that they've been in one environment for set periods of time they've not had contact with key relationships in their life they've not been able to maintain uh, relationships with family members for example uh, and that's been really distressing for for some people yeah. for other people it's been a bit of a relief to be honest and and they've they, they found it really good to not have the social pressures that they get from from society every day to not have to face um you know bashing trolleys in in tesco's with other people and to not have to face large crowds of people to face the demands of being in a social situation where you're expected to talk and expected to do things yeah. um so some people have found it really relieving to not have those pressures in their life yeah. but now we're going to get back to okay well we need those things in their life because they they help a person have quality of life and help them to expand on their experiences. How are we going to start getting those things back into the person's life and for, to help people to learn to cope with those social pressures so they can experience more more new things? Mm. So in, in terms of learning disability nursing, there seem to be some real parallels with mental health nursing. And the kind of experience you're describing for people with learning disabilities with COVID has been something which I think everybody has experienced to some extent, but I guess it depends what you're coping and support mechanisms are like as to how you manage with those things, particularly if routine is very important and then it's whipped away. Definitely, yeah. Mm -hmm. For most people, routine and structure are really important. You think if if you've got a, a learning disability, a disability in learning, mm -hmm. you, you have um, less cognitive flexibility, I guess, to understand the world. Mm -hmm. You won't necessarily have the markers that in your day that we have, like being able to tell the time or mm -hmm. know that, breakfast means one part of the day, lunch means another, and dinner means another. So you create your own structures and routines to let you know when things happen and make things predictable and, and to know everything's safe. So you mm. take them away from people, it's ripping away their safety blanket. Mm, yeah, really difficult time. Mm. So how are, how are things working in terms of sort of social care with learning disability at the moment? What's the sort of situation there? I, I think it's a, a really difficult time to be honest in social care I think we're all feeling the challenges of recruitment at the moment uh, and social care in particular is finding recruitment really difficult 
Um, partly that's been impacted by Brexit, partly by COVID. And I think people, a lot of people have had reevaluated their lifestyles and thought about what's important to them during that time. So, so that's a challenge. We've also seen um, inflation and cost of living rises, and we've seen other industries respond to that by putting up their wages. Mm. But their health and social care is mandated by government. Uh, mm. We're not increasing that to the same rate. So you can get paid £12 an hour to go and work in Aldi. Um, we're still paying, we will we pay 10 35 an hour to be a support worker and we can't compete with, with that kind of market and you know, go in a shop and stack shelves and go home again or work with, with complex people and, you know, mentally, physically, emotionally challenging at times, incredibly rewarding, but, um, you know, what would you choose if you got paid more to do less? And so, yeah. It's very difficult. I think as well in learning disability support in particular, <clears throat> we've been shifting for a long time in moving away from hospital based services and NHS based services to to providing better social care for people in the community in their own homes. Um, and that's been accelerated in learning disability support. So you might know there was a BBC Panorama programme back in 2011, and that showed people with learning disabilities in the hospital being horrifically abused. It, it was appalling. Yeah, hard to watch, wasn't it? Yeah, but, you know, a crisis like that leads to public outrage, which leads to change. So mm. as, as devastating as it is, it ends up being a driver for change, and we've seen great momentum from that, mm. particularly from people with learning disabilities themselves and their families, what they're screaming out loud about what they want. Mm. Um, in response, there's been a national programme to close the hospitals quicker and to get social care better. But in the same vein, really, it's um, hospitals can't, are saying they can't discharge people because there's not the skilled enough social care out there. And um, and people are still needing to be admitted. So we, I think we are starting to see people being still being admitted to hospital, but they're getting moved further away because there's less local services for them. Uh, and it's still taking a long time for them to be discharged because there's not the appropriate social care out there. Mm -hmm. Housing is a big part of the problem. A lot of people with learning disability require very specialist housing. Um, mm -hmm. You might need to make sure that the property is suitable for a robust environment in case there are behaviours that could cause damage to the property. Um, but it's also thinking of what sensory sensitivities the person might have. So you might have to think about what's, what's the lighting like, what's the background noise that's there, how much space is there and things like that. So there's a lot to consider. And equally, there have been um, programmes going on in local authorities for about 10 years at least, where they've been trying to close registered care homes. So there's not the, the care home provision. It's about looking at the, the rental market to get a property. So there's there's... There's still a lot to be done in getting community support right, getting the right environments, the right yeah. skin support in the community to make those hospital admissions redundant. Mm. So for anyone who's a youngster, one good for you. Yeah. <laughs> it's Winterbourne View if you're if you're trying to find out what we were talking about there. And it was something that was very um very shocking. So do be aware if you are going to look at that footage, it is very distressing. And people went to prison quite rightly for it because it was crime, basically. Yeah, I think I think it's essential that people do watch it. We we shouldn't forget what was uh, revealed in that program because you know we we need to make sure those lessons are learned. We said at the time never again, and then what was it three years ago? Yeah. Another panorama was on about Wharton Hall Hospital, yeah. where people were being psychologically abused instead of physically abused there. But it was still yeah. just as difficult to watch. And yeah. what happened to the promises of never again? So. Yeah. And again, it takes back to kind of quality of staff and support for those staff and how people are educated about learning disability. And that that's patchy at best, isn't it? And again, if you're saying you can be employed doing a job like shelf stacking, which is a great and noble job, and God knows we've needed it desperately in COVID, but it doesn't require the same kind of psychological, no. emotional labour as being with people maybe who have communication needs or behavioural disturbance. It's not the same. No. It's not surprising that it's almost like a court. So you're almost having to pay to the pleasure of doing it. And that's that's not how it should be. It should be properly um, rewarded. And I think some of the, the best support worker staff that I've seen are there because their heart's in it. Yeah. Quite often people come into the, the profession because they've had they've got personal experience themselves or family members involved. Yeah. Um, and 
there's a big focus in learning disability services and, and other services as well, I know, in being person-centered and personalized in your approach. And, and we find, you know, if people are coming to work for that person, not for the paycheck, not for the company, they're there for the person that they're supporting. They're just so much more invested. They spend more time building rapport with that person and building relationships. Um, it leads to better retention. And it's not just about earning a wage, then it's going home with that smug feeling of, you know what, I've made a difference today. And yeah. that, that's what it's all about, isn't it? Yeah. I enjoyed doing that, that part of my training, but I wasn't, it wasn't anything I was particularly gifted at. And I think <laughs> that was pretty clear. <laughs> and then watching people who did have that passion for it was so exciting and interesting to do it made me very sure that I was not that kind of nurse but really proud of the people that could just handle it and, and manage it and connect through really significant barriers it's a real skill and I think should be really recognized as such so I guess we've talked a little bit about kind of social care and we've talked a little bit about some of the problems that are underlying for learning disability nursing let's investigate that before we go on to talk about some cheerful stuff as well so what are the big issues at the moment for for people trying to work in this environment um so i suppose it is that that change from from um hospital to community focused um there's lots of um initiatives to create different roles for learning disability nursing and to realize the the contribution we can make mm. so um a role that's only been exist in existence for about 10 years is hospital liaison nurses where they will work in a general hospital and provide assessment to the person um, but they'll also provide guidance and support to the hospital staff on how best to meet that person's needs and make sure yeah. that the hospitals are accessible so a lot of new and emerging roles are in place and I think uh, that, that is just one example and I think the the challenge is I think that for, for learning disability nursing it can be hard to know at, at this time um, what what does the world want of me? <laughs> do you know what I mean? What's my mandate to be here? And and where do you want me to go with this career and the skills that I've got? Mm. Um, so there's not really a, a lot of consistency in provision at the moment. So you could go to a hospital in Southampton and there'd be three hospital liaison nurses. You could go to Sheffield and there wouldn't be any. Um, so we've mm -hmm. not got that parity of services for people with learning disabilities. And that affects people's lives. People die as yeah. a result of not having access to those um, yeah. those accessibility supports. Um, I think we we've got to try and make sure that the needs of people with learning disabilities are understood and why we're we're here. I think we're we're our own worst enemy in a lot of ways. We enable people to be independent and to do things on their own, and that means that we're pushing the people we support to the forefront and making sure we're in the background and we're not seen doing what we're doing because it's about them, it's not about us. Um, but yeah, I think um, in layman's terms, a lot of the terms we use in learning disability services can be misunderstood. So we'll talk about, you know, we want to help people to be independent and we want people to have rights and we want people to have choice. And absolutely. Um, but it's thinking about how we make that meaningful in learning disability services. So how do people have meaningful choice? How do people have um, meaningful access to their rights? And what, what supports do we need to make that happen? So for someone with severe learning disabilities, for example, um, they may have difficulty in uh, making a decision about what to eat. So how can we put that decision to them in a way that helps them to make those choices? Um, they may never be able to make a choice about where they live. They may not have the capacity to make, make those kind of decisions. So we can't make we can't make statements like he's choosing to do that without thoroughly checking we support him to make the choices as best as, as we can. Mm -hmm. um, and yes, we want people to be independent, but what sort of support structures are needed behind that person to get them to the independence that they want to be. So I, don't, I think those terms can sometimes get not misunderstood, but yeah. taken at surface level, I suppose, from lay person. You don't always see all of the, the background structure that happens below to make it a reality. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I guess I've got a couple of things that have come through from um, from my WhatsApp on for students, if that's okay. Do you want to take a couple of student questions? Yeah, of course. <laughs> they're, they're obligated to ask. So. <laughs> <laughs> I've got Darius um, asking, why did you become a learning disability nurse? And I wish I'd asked that question because I always think it's really interesting how somebody ends up in the field that they do. Um, and the other one um, for Mario is, is there any one thing that you could change? What would it be? 
I guess she means about learning to speak the nursing, nothing personal. <laughs> so um, I became a learning disability nurse because at the age of 19, I had a significant head injury. Um, I, um, I, the doctors told my parents first I was going to die. Uh, and then um, I was in a coma for six days. And they said, oh, no, he's not going to die. But the doctor's words were, he'll be a cabbage. Um, so that kind of shows some of the value to disability that that can be had in the yeah. medical profession. Um, yeah. Fortunately, I recovered better than expected. But, you know, when you go through a, a life-changing experience like that, you, you can't help think, but, crap, what would my life have been like if that was the case? I, I, you know, what what support would have been there for me? Mm-hmm. Um, what would my day-to-day life have been like? And that's when I started to think, look around and I found out about learning disability nursing. Um, mm-hmm. And I, I think it gives me a unique, not an exclusive, but a, a unique perspective into support because I'm every time I'm looking at support services, I'm thinking well, that could be me sat there getting that support and would it be good enough for me? And I always encourage everyone to try and put themselves in that position. If it was you there, would that support Mm -hmm. be good enough for you? If you Mm -hmm. can't do it from your own perspective, think it could be your mum, your daughter, your sister, your brother. Um, And I think sometimes in care, we get into routines and we get into practices and we can lose some of that personalisation. So it is just trying to remember that. So, yeah, that's how I got into it. Um, if there was one thing I could change, I'd, I'd love to take the um, the hatred in the world that out out of the world, if possible. I think there are some cruel people out there that just don't understand learning disabilities, that don't have time for it. I think some of that, with with any cruelty and any kind of discrimination, there's usually an underlying fear behind it. So it's usually thinking about why are you afraid of people with learning disabilities? And mm. there's people that we support that we've had um, neighbours complain to us, complain to their MPs and say, you know, not in my backyard. Why are these people living here? Why aren't they in hospital? Um, and, you yeah, know, we... We know that hate crime is um, prevalent in people with learning disabilities. There there was a report by Dimensions that said something like 60% of people with learning disabilities um, reported experiencing hate crime. I mean, I I think that's an understatement. It's got to be 95, 97% of people because it's just so prevalent out there. Um, So, I mean, we're trying to do our bit with that at PBS4. We're we're a third-party hate crime reporting centre, so Mm -hmm. people with learning disabilities can come to us if they can't go to the police and they can say, I think I may have experienced a hate crime. Can you tell me what to do or can you report it to the police for me and or can you help me to stop it? Because that's what most people want to happen straight away. So, so yeah, probably the one thing I would change is to take some of the hatred out of the world. Mm -hmm. Definitely, definitely. I think it's 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 always hard when you see somebody victimised or harassed because of who they are, and it's so much worse when you know that person can't defend or maybe report in the same yeah. way, and that's really difficult to see. When yeah. you meet someone with learning disabilities for the first time, it's not unusual to be afraid, um, and I think you know, if, if someone can't use words to communicate and their behaviours are a bit strange and they don't get social distancing, so they'll come right up in your face and mm. you know they might be making noises or they might be distressed themselves and trying to tell you to go away. Um, when, you're, when you're experiencing that really close up for the first time and you don't know the person, you can be really scared. And I remember when I was a student nurse, I was working um, at a, um, a hospital unit there called White Lodge. And uh, there was a man there and I, he he taught me so much. And um, he was just this big enigma to me at first. He was this doing all these strange behaviours and I didn't know what he was doing and I didn't know whether to be scared or whether to try and interact with him. And it was just about, you know, trying to find a, a personal distance that we both felt close enough to each other. Um, I started using an approach called intensive interaction, which is where you have a conversation with behaviours effectively. So he'd do these rocking backwards and forwards behaviours and I'd mirror him doing those rocking backwards and forwards behaviours and he was like respectful echoing of each other uh, in the same way as I say something, then you say something and we, we start having that conversation. Um, then he started to reach out and pull me in closer and we just started to build that that trust and rapport. And yeah. you know, I think if you, if you can't be accepting and take people in and, and build that rapport, you miss it on 
how magical it is to have those kind of interactions and that kind of connection with someone. Mm. Uh, and that stops the person from developing and thriving and, and being their best ultimately mm. as well. Mm. Oh, you, you only need the tiniest bit of empathy to think how it must be not to be heard or understood yeah. and, and try so hard to connect yeah. and just be completely misunderstood. And the idea that someone would try to connect to you in itself is so healing, isn't it? It's amazing. Well, if you think if you're a person with learning disabilities, and every time you've tried to do something, people have mocked you for it, or you've been told you're doing it wrong, or you've been told you can't do that. People must mm. have really, really low self-esteem. And a lot of what we do is mm. help people to build that confidence and to go, you know, try it, see how you do, and try it for a little bit. And if you have to walk away and come back, then at least you've tried it for a little bit, and you, we can build on that success. Mm. People. So a lot of it is that um, confidence building and, and boosting mm. some I know for um, older people's services and for mental health services, sometimes it's to talk about rehabilitation and recovery. Mm. For a person with learning disabilities, it might be about habilitation. It might be about learning those skills for the first time, trying to I don't know, cook yourself a meal for the first time because yeah. you had the opportunities to try it before. Yeah, I mean, when I, when I sound like a billion years old, I'm about to sound like a billion years old. When I first started and I was a baby nurse, we did lots of work with people who had been institutionalised in the most... But nobody had tried to hurt them. Everybody had tried to take care of them. And they'd basically just taken away huge chunks of that person's life. Like people who didn't know how they liked their tea because they were just given institutional tea, like made in a big urn with like 10 tea bags and half bag of sugar and milk. And I'm amazed anyone was that any of those guys weren't diabetic because, you know, the kind of idea that you just had this kind of standard. And then actually sort of like working with people to figure out what do you like to eat? What do you like to wear? And, and nobody had ever helped people flourish in that way and help people fulfill their own personal identity and become an individual. And it was very strange to see. And it was it was quite a strange work to do, but really fulfilling because there was no lack of individuality, just a lack of opportunity to be. And it was, yeah. Yeah. So if we give people a chance, they, they can thrive, but you, it's, um, it's understanding where they're coming from with that. I mean, if... If I was really scared um, about doing jambalaya or something like that, I haven't got a clue what it is. You've never told it to me before. You said jambalaya, let's go do jambalaya. I might, I might start doing things to in, uh, encourage you that I don't want to do that. Um, so I, I might, I don't know, um, do some self-interest behaviour perhaps or just do something to make you go away and to take away that demand from me. Um, but if you can gently introduce the topic to me and help me overcome some of those anxieties, just like you would do with any sort of anxiety <laughs> approach really, um, then I might start to build that confidence and trust in you to be with yeah. me, not to put me in something that's going to make me feel awful uh, yeah. and that you're going to be there and that you'll let me walk away if it's too much. Yeah. Um, so it's just trying to build all of those confidences yeah. in people. And actually hear no is really important as well, isn't it? Yeah. I love jambalaya. Not everyone in the whole world wants to. If, if you love a cheese sandwich and cheese sandwich is the best thing on earth and all you want is a cheese sandwich, no jambalaya in the world is going to cut it. <laughs> and our our wish to like have a palate of the world for this person is really not, not really about what they want at all. And it's, no. it's, it, it's, it's what's interesting, isn't it, when you do those sorts of exercises to think, actually, what's in this person's best interest? Because I have favourite food that I would prefer to have rather than anything else yeah. because that's what people do and... Yeah. And I think the other part that we, we really came across that was um, the lack of acknowledgement of other people's relationships, be it friendship, be it closeness of all kinds, and thinking that nobody could really have intimate relationships. And I don't mean sexual relationships necessarily, although that is part of it for some people. But this idea that you could have a meaningful connection to somebody else who also had um, a learning disability. Mm -hmm. And it was okay just to move people apart from each other and break friendship groups up. And, and I was, you know, when you've lived with someone in an almost like a family unit on a ward for 25 years. The idea was just like, oh, they go into these spaces. And it, it just blew my mind that people hadn't thought this through. Like, oh, he seems to be missing his his friends. They're like, yeah. because he's a person. There's people yeah. we support and, you know, they, they could be 20 years old and had 12 different placements already. And yeah. they, they, they're learning that I do this and that means I've blown it and that means I'm going to get moved somewhere else. So we've got to try and mm. re help people relearn that, you know, you mm. can have bad days, you can make mistakes and things can go wrong and we're not going to give up on you. We're, we're still there for you and mm. we'll see it through. It's, it's very difficult. Yeah. I think sometimes the system teaches 
the wrong lesson. It doesn't realize that you've got the lesson you're trying to teach and then the lesson you're actually teaching somebody, which is about a lack of forgiveness, a lack of ability to make amends and all that stuff is really complicated. And I, I'd like to talk about learning to be lessons in social care because I think this is this is something else that it's something I'm passionate about because obviously it's it's the other half of my my life. Um <laughs> but learning to lesson is one of the well, it is the smallest branch of nursing. There's 17,000 yeah. learning disability nurses on the NMC register. Yeah. That's just three percent. So we're yeah. we're tiny, yeah. um, and we we know that about three thousand of them in England are working in the NHS. We're not too sure where the others are. We've just finished doing some benchmark, um, some sorry, some mapping with NHS benchmarking, and we've got a bit of a better idea now. There's there's still like a lot of vagueness because the the data isn't as brilliant as it could be, but we know that there are at least as many learning disability nurses working in social care as there are in the NHS, and I think um, that this is where clinically led social care can make a difference. Uh, and learning disability nurses that are working in social care settings. Um, it can provide that clinical leadership, it can provide that assessment, so, um, the training and support, the mentoring to the staff about, about um, how they should approach mm. support. Um, it can make a huge difference. And I think if we can grow that workforce, or at least we don't we probably just need to grow, there's probably enough of us out there, we probably just need to make sure that we're all aligned, that we know what our direction is, we know that we're valued in that workplace, and this is this is what we're there for we could make some huge differences going forward. So I, I think there is a wealth of careers um, going on. At, um, there's a, uh, one of the um, finalists in the um, the RCN Awards last year in the learning disability cat category. Uh, it was a lady called Jane Nichols, and she works for a social care provider called McIntyre. And they're really valuing learning disability nurses in, in, in their company. Um, and what Jane has done is she's trained to be um, an admiral nurse as well. So she's specialising in dementia care. Dementia in learning disabilities is um, very significant, particularly people with Down syndrome where you get early onset dementia from the age of 40. Um, and to bring together learning disability expertise with dementia expertise and to offer that. I think that's just amazing. So there's, there's so much more career pathways out there that, that we can start exploring uh, and some real trailblazers showing how it can be done. Yeah. But if you're ever feeling like depressed or low, go and have a look at nurses who've won awards recently and it will it will really change your mm. ideas about what's possible. Because yeah. we were saying before, they're a bit like spotlights on amazing practice, but the amazing practice they're doing should just be standard practice. So, you know, the much as you can learn and share that information is really important. Yeah, if you go to um, the RCN um, learning disability clinical pages, hmm. um, there's a tab on there that's called celebrating good practice, and we've we've put on there all of the winners last year. Hmm. And um, the one, the lady that won the overall award was a lady called Rebecca Crossley, and she did some amazing work in making um, COVID vaccines accessible to people with learning disabilities. We already talked about how some people find those social situations difficult. Preparing to have an injection can be really difficult. So to apply her learning disability nursing expertise into what people need and to think mm. about how to get the environment right. Um, she was saying there was something about the needles um, that they, they were at risk of breaking in people's arms with one of the types. So she advocated with the um, pharmaceutical company and got them to change uh, how they present the needles that they uh, present the injections in. Mm. Um just some real mm. amazing work and sometimes you look at it and you go well that's common sense isn't it but I don't think common sense is that common and um sometimes you need the learning disability nursing expertise to really dig, dig, dig and get through and that's such a you know it's a, it's a fundamental human rights issue isn't it yeah. that a huge part of our population people with learning disabilities were left uncovered and had a higher death rate from covid because of a lot of factors but the fact that that was their experience is really uncomfortable to see because one of the things COVID did was show up the cracks and the fault lines, didn't it, very effectively. Very the idea that they wouldn't have the same access to safe vaccines is really problematic. Like very early on in the pandemic, mm -hmm. there were there was blanket DNR um, decisions being made about people with learning disabilities. Yeah, that, really that was shocking. Yeah. I mean, thankfully, that yeah. got overturned. Um, but yeah, it, it was really difficult to say. Well, where where are people with learning disabilities in this priority list of who needs the vaccines? Why aren't they higher? And yeah. Um, but yeah, I think again back to people with learning disabilities themselves and their families. 
they've it's amazing that they've got a strong voice now they've got organizations yeah. that will support them to have that voice and mm. we live in a in a world where people listen it's mm. which is great so mm. um but yeah without those people that stood up for people then they may not have done yeah. i mean it's it's a you can't get a clearer understanding can you of how people feel about a situation than just saying don't bother no and i think that the activism that happened in in response to that was really well, it had to happen, but it was it was a really exciting thing to see people finding their voice and really really standing up for their rights, because it was often services that led that, and that was exciting to see. Social media's had a really big role in that, I think. Mm. Uh, we've seen it in nursing communities how it's helped mm. nurses to connect, but mm. I think it's it's really helped people with lonely disabilities and their families to connect mm. um, and to say, you know, we're, we're not going to stand for this. If mm. you're doing things and it's not good enough for us, we will rally up and we will we will tell you that this isn't good enough. Mm. I've got a couple of questions coming, but I just I'm very realizing we haven't read anything to Dave yet. Did you want to say anything, Dave, or have any questions for us? Yep. Yeah, hi there. Uh, so we've had a few questions come in. Uh, there's one that's come in that's kind of asking about the policy around uh, learning disabilities and learning disability nursing. Uh, and it's kind of phrased in a way of saying that there's obviously this kind of parity of esteem between physical health and mental health. And kind of a, a effort to kind of push for that to happen. Should there be something similar for people with a learning disability so they can kind of expect the same parity? Yes, I, I would see that as coming under the Equality Act and, and that kind of legislation, really. Because, um, you yeah, know, a learning disability isn't a mental health need and it isn't a physical problem. It, it can come with a, accompanied by those things for sure. Um, but it's about... Uh, people with learning disabilities are human beings and need to be treated equally as humans. So how, how do we make sure that they have the same access, the same respect and the same acceptance in our communities as everybody else? So I think that's, that's the key underpinning. Uh, and, and I suppose one of the things when I sort of saw this question was that, that I know when they were debating the Mental Health Act review in Parliament, uh, there was quite a bit said about the kind of forced sort of imprisonment of people with learning disabilities and how they were really kind of keen to stop that from happening. I suppose, you know, it would be nice if the reality matches that, you know, clear rhetoric in terms of, you know, wanting that to, to happen. Are you, are you kind of confident that the, the kind of will to do it is there? Definitely. There, there's been a lot of positive action taken by governments across the UK, um, looking at what they can do to um, avoid long-term segregation. Um, I mean, if you look at the, the data, I think it's easy to look post Winterbourne view and say, you know, there's still about 2,000 people with learning disabilities in secure hospital settings. It depends on what, how, how big a lens you want to look at. If you go back to 1988, there was 35,000 people with learning disabilities in a hospital setting. And you can see on a graph over time that that curve has come down. The transforming care agenda post Winterbourne view did nudge that further and it pushed things further. There are two, still 2,000 people with learning disabilities in the hospital. They still probably shouldn't be there and we should be able to have services that are more suitable to meet in their needs. Um, but I think change takes time uh, and we, we're getting there. And I think there is will always for that to happen. Yeah, I, I know earlier you were talking obviously about the uh, learning disability field of nursing. Uh, I think interestingly tonight, you know, the three of us, we're all from different uh, fields of nursing. Uh, I, I suppose, have you got any advice for non-learning disability nurses on how we can pick up some of the, you know, important messages, skills that, you, you know, we can support people with a learning disability much better? Um, so you, the, the first thing to think about is, is communication and it's thinking about communication is much more than words. Um, you, you, you've got two of these and one of these, so it's making sure you're listening more than you're talking and um, never assume that a person can't communicate. So um, they will be giving you a message of some kind or showing you their preferences. Um, so yeah, try and listen to their actions uh, and their presentation. Um, take your time. Um, you know, what's the rush? Let, let's see if we can slow things down and, and think things through. Um, if if something can't be done, does it need to be done right now? Can you delay it? So, yeah, they're probably the, the two key bits. Um, and, yeah, 
don't be afraid. I think, or or if you are afraid, try 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 and relax and not show it, uh, and think about what that fear is about and how you can overcome that fear. Yeah, and and I know kind of because I've been working at a mass vaccination centre over the last year, uh, and obviously one of the challenges that we've got in that environment is wanting to get through a vast number of people. You know, uh, at one point we were vaccinating over three thousand people a day in our centre, uh, and I think what we always wanted to do was whenever we came across anyone that uh, appeared to need kind of some uh, alternative arrangements in terms of delivering the service, that we took that time uh, to kind of take a step back and say, you know, we're not going to rush you through this. You know, we want to think about how we can do it in the way that best fits you, talking to the person, the people with them, uh, uh, you know, and, and considering what adaptations we could make. And I think most of the time we've done a pretty good job in terms of making sure that everyone that came for a vaccine got a vaccine and and could give a, a, a decent response. But I suppose one of the, the things that I pick up on that is that that was at a time when we were putting a huge amount of resource into a service because it was so critical. I suppose learning disabilities often probably doesn't see that kind of investment in in the service. Mm-hmm. So I suppose it's it's really critical for nurses to have a a strong voice to make sure that the voice of the the person at the centre of the care does have that safe service, in, 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 isn't it? And you know that's critical. Definitely, and I think it's it's remembering that every um, every occurrence is a learning opportunity. I mean, for us, it's a learning opportunity, and we'll reflect on it and how it can end, but. For a person with learning disabilities, if they're coming to a vaccination clinic, for example, and that visit goes horribly wrong, then they're going to be a lot less likely to try and come back for a second try. Um, so you know, if you can try and make it as much a success as possible, and it, that success might mean that it doesn't happen on that day, but it might mean that they step through the front door, that they say hello to you, and they get to recognise your face. Then they go away and happy, and they feel a lot more confident the next time they come back. They're a bit less scared, they're a bit more confident, and they can move on to the next step. Yeah. Uh, one of the questions that Nikki, you might be able to share some thoughts on is uh, kind of, uh, you know, the issue with nurses being sort of educated in, in the fields of nursing uh, and how much kind of overlap there is. I know when I was uh, a student nurse in 98, uh, we didn't actually have a cohort of learning disability nurses with us. So, you know, there was just uh, adult and mental health nurses on the course that I was on. Uh, so I suppose there's maybe two questions there. One is how much overlap is there, could there be, when all four fields are together in one university? And in scenarios where they're not together, should we be kind of engineering opportunities for those people to come together, you know, more often? Well, I think I would say what anybody would say under the circumstances, which is that you should be able to provide care to a safe standard for any member of the public. People have learned to people. So whilst you have like a specialist care, I think if you walk into an A&E department or if you're a parent with a learning disability, you should be able to talk to CAMS nurses, able to talk to adult nurses. If you have dementia, you should be getting a really solid dementia service. And one of the big issues is that so many universities have stopped providing LD courses because you can't recruit a decent big enough cohort. What might make a difference is because we're doing so much work online now, we might be able to pull resources and actually draw from a much bigger pool. So you wouldn't necessarily need people to live in your area. Um, and that might make a difference. But certainly I think that the best way for people to learn is to have people with learning disabilities come in and talk because it's great to be a nurse for somebody, but it's much better to, I think, hear what services or, or care or client, client or a carer think and where we've fallen down. And you can really learn from that. And I think that's a, a good way of learning. But I've got, I've got, we're running out of time. We've got a couple of things we're supposed to have mentioned. So one of which is the um, Connecting for Change report, which I've tweeted out. Yep, so, thank you very much. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. I published in July, and it yep. was basically talking about um, what's happening in learning disability nursing across the four countries and what the RCN pledges to do and what we think needs to happen next. So, yeah, if you're, if you're interested, please do have a read. I've got a cracking question that's coming from iPhone, which kills me because I never know who that person is. They're saying their cousin has um, a learning disability. And what one of the what do you think about the representations on TV and film of people with learning disability? Um, particularly when that person has, um, I think, of, of my, have I frozen or have you frozen? One of us is freezing. Am um, I freezing still or have I stopped? 
you stopped. Oh, good. You jump, in, you jump in, in and out, Nikki, but it's good enough to know what you said. Yeah, so somebody who's asking about the representation, and I think the thing that they were pointing at was this idea that if you want to win an Oscar, play a disability. And I was like, oh, I've got to ask Jonathan about that. Yeah. <laughs> Before and we go, what do you traditionally, think? Traditionally, there has been, hasn't there? Um, there there's a one called um, I Am Sam, which uh, Sean Penn plays um, a man with learning disabilities. Um, so, yeah, there there is lots of examples of that. I mean, Dustin Hoffman in Rain Man, for example, as well. There's lots of examples straight on. But we are seeing more and more learning disability actors and actresses, um, you know, what, coming out in the field. So, um, now what's his name? Tommy, I've forgotten his surname, but there's Tommy, who's from the Winchester Blue Apple Theatre Company, uh, and he's appeared in Line of Duty uh, and uh, dramas like that. He's doing fantastic at representing uh, mm -hmm. people with learning disabilities. Uh, George. Uh, I forget his surname too, but he's a, a man with Down syndrome that is a presenter on CBeebies. Um, so we're seeing more real people with learning disabilities um, getting acknowledgement uh, and, and getting jobs in, in those, those roles. Brilliant to see. Um, not everyone with a learning disability will be able to do those roles or will be able to have a job. And I don't know, I, I think I've, I don't mind... I don't take offence necessarily to to people acting as they have a learning disability. Um, it it is it's about is that is that person being respectfully depicted or not? Uh, and you know, are we showing respect to them? And I, I think in most contemporary um, drama, that it is. But yeah. It, we are seeing better representation. If anyone's interested, have a look at Mencap Mythbusters campaign because there's some really good examples there of people with learning disability busting myths about what what learning disability needs. Um, so um, we've got down there. There's a, a woman that does uh, modelling for some of the you know big fashion companies in Italy. Um, there are uh, Olympians. There, there, yeah, actors. It, it's really inspirational to see. Mm -hmm. And um, Dave's got a couple of questions, so we'll come over to him. Yes, yeah, so uh, just done a quick bit of Googling. Tommy Jessup and George Webster are the two uh, TV uh, actors and you know, personalities there. Uh, I just wanted to ask another question. Uh, I was involved in the uh, Learning Disability Nursing All England plan, so that was something led by Health Education England. Uh, I think that came out October 2020. Uh, have you felt that it's made any difference, especially in light of the mental health nursing version getting launched probably later this year? Yes, absolutely. Um, I think before the All England plan, we were regularly saying, well, there's loads of stuff happening in learning disability nursing, but it's just not connected and, you know, we're not pulling it together. And I do think that the All England plan has helped to do that. Um, I think there are some people that say it's not very clear what the All England plan is because it's not a very visible thing. There's there's an easy read version on NHS England's website. There's a um, an Excel spreadsheet with the action plan on it that gets circulated before each of the meetings. So it's not the most visible out there, perhaps, of, of all the things that's going on. Um, but it really has brought everyone together. It's given a shared thread to what everyone's doing. Um, and yeah, it, it has really started to make a difference. Um, big challenges we've had has been, you know, since 2016, when the bursaries were cut, the number of nursing students coming through has significantly dropped in learning disability nursing. Many students were mature students, and the mm -hmm. fact of studying mature without a decent income, or I can't really call it a bursary a decent income, but without, without a bursary even, um, just wasn't practical. So we saw numbers plummet. There has been a real increase in efforts to get those numbers up. We're seeing in enhanced funding available for apprenticeship routes, for example. Um, so there are cash incentives for people to go. There's a lot being done to raise awareness about what learning disability nurses do. And all of that's been part of the All England plan as well. So, so yeah, I think it has it's made a, it's made a huge difference. Um, still lots to be done. Um, but the day that we think that it's done will be the day we need to retire because we won't be doing our jobs properly. So there, there will always be lots to do, I'm sure. But um, yeah, lots of really positive work happening. Brilliant. I've just tweeted out that um, Mythbusters. Oh, thank you. And I think we need to start thinking about finishing up. So Dave, do you have any last questions or last thoughts for Jonathan? 
Well, I was just doing multiple things on the screen there. Uh, no, I, I think, you know, it's, it's been a great conversation. And I, I think, you know, we've had quite a lot of questions that have come in just at the end there. Uh, so I've found it really difficult to kind of keep up with the tweeting uh, through that. So I've just put on a message saying, you know, if people did want to kind of catch up on the questions and the answers that have been asked. It's, you know, it's a really valuable resource to, to watch it. Uh, and I, th I think, you know, the bit for me is, uh, is, is I'm really keen about the kind of how we sort of support each branch of nursing to see its value in itself and also how they can work together to kind of uh, support each other. Because uh, I think what I always find a bit sad is when I go to speak to uh, a branch of nursing and they kind of talk about how they feel that they're the most un kind of loved, uncared for branch. Uh, and irrespective of which of the four I speak to, they'll, they'll all give that same kind of message. Uh, and, and I think there is that bit about the, the importance of us coming together as a nursing family, of us kind of valuing each other's sort of uh, different roles, but also kind of, you know, seeing the value of them. Uh, and certainly, you know, the bit about the how important it is that we uh, kind of have the learning disability nursing voice as, as part of that. Uh, and like I say, in terms of my own clinical practice over the last year or so, it's been so sort of clear of, of how, how critical that is and, and how it makes such a big difference. Absolutely. Jonathan, is there anything you wanted to, to, to leave the audience with? Um, I think it's hard to have a conversation at the moment and not think about Ukraine. And um, something that has been on my mind recently is how um, the war in Ukraine is affecting people with learning disabilities. So I, I am saying this purely from a humanitarian perspective. I think people with learning disabilities in Ukraine um, are suffering. Um, they're not able to evacuate the country as people without disabilities are. There's not accessible transport. Their support could be leaving and they could be being left abandoned. They may not have access to medications that they need. Um, I am going to try and do a seminar soon about that, so uh, please do keep an eye out for that if you're interested. Um, but I think we all feel quite helpless seeing all the, the tragedies that are happening in Ukraine at the moment. And one way of dealing with that tragedy is thinking, what can you do to help? So it might be, you know, how to write to your MP, um, which charities to give to to make, to make the most impact and things like that. So um there's a, a lot of useful information about how it's been impacting on people who learn disabilities on the inclusion europe website if you want to look at it um, and as i say if, if i do manage to get a seminar going about it i will share um but yeah that that's the, I suppose the only thing we, we haven't covered that i'd, I'd just like yeah. to mean absolutely and um for anyone who's like had questions they haven't had it asked or that this is a subject they'd like us to come back to with any particular um area of interest i know we were thinking a lot about maybe at some point talking about pbs and things like that so if that's an area of interest let us know and we can arrange something and we will definitely be sharing with you um the uh, any future work that comes out so thank you very much and thank you so much jonathan for mentioning all these resources that we can be using and we, we're tweeting out as we go um, and thank you very much everybody for participating tonight be a bit quiet but then loud at the end so i'm not i'm not, I'm not criticizing but do talk to us from the start so that we can ask lots more questions so we'd love to hear what you've got to say um, and thank you very much for your time tonight it's been really lovely speaking with you all and have a good evening take care bye bye Night-night.